Okay. Ooh, sorry. Sorry about that. Okay. Well, I'm going to wait for my video specialist back there to get the camera going. Okay. All right. So my name is Nat Ballou. I'm the pro programming coordinator for the Tech Lab. Doug Sallet is our tech lead here. Today, I hope you're all here for a, a tech talk from the uh, Tech Lab, because if you're not in the wrong place. Um, today, we're fortunate enough to have uh, indu industry expert, Kevin Rowling, uh, who's currently the head of artificial intelligence at Presence AI. He's going to give us a talk uh, about the technology behind chat GPT, large language models. So if you don't know what large language models are, you're going to learn a lot in the next hour. Okay, Kevin. All right. I think, oh, there's my mic. Cool. Uh, thank you all for coming. I know it's a beautiful Sunday, uh, and you could be paddle boarding right now, or hiking, or uh, doing some other outdoor activity on one of our few wonderful sunny P&W days. So thank you for coming to this talk. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Nat. Yeah. I, uh, so yeah, my name is Kevin. Uh, I'm the head of AI at a company called Presence. Um, we uh, we're a consulting company. We build software for other companies, as consulting companies do. Um, yeah, we've got a bunch of computer vision projects. We've got a bunch of large language model projects. So I'm very happy to have been able to work on a lot of this stuff. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm going to talk about large language models. This talk definitely like leans on the technical side. Um, but uh, feel free to ask questions. This is you know not like a huge group. This is, so uh, if you have a question, just raise your hand, and I'll call on you, and I'll do my best to try and answer it. Um, so no need to wait till the end, although I will have some time at the end for questions, too. So uh, we're going to talk about large language models. Um, I'll start by just talking about like what is a large language model. Um, so it's basically a type of artificial intelligence model that is trained to understand and generate human-like text. Um, these models are called large both due to the size of these models. So they're very big. Um, I'll talk about what that means in a second. And also the amount of data that's used to train these things um, is really big too. They're, they're large, so large language models. Um, so NLP, which is natural language processing, goes back to the 1980s, as I was just discussing with Doug right before this talk. Um, so uh, people have been working on this problem of how do we get computers to understand text for a very long time? Um, there's been lots of incremental progress over the years, although in recent years, uh, as you probably have heard, which is probably why you're here, we've had a bit of an inflection point with this. Um, but uh, NLP is kind of like the large bucket of natural language processing. Um, large language models are like a specific type of model inside that broad category of NLP. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, we're kind of at this like AI inflection point. Why, why is this happening? You know, why, why did we all of a sudden get chat GPT and all of these other things coming up? Um, and there's a bunch of things that have all kind of come together to make this happen. Uh, the first one is access to just massive amounts of data on the internet. Uh, I'm sure you've probably been on the internet. There's a lot of stuff on there. Um, unsupervised learning algorithms. Um, so uh, I'll talk a little bit more about what unsupervised means, but it, it's basically like you don't have to have a human go through all of your data and be like, this is good. This is, you know, this is an apple, this is banana, like going through labeling everything. Um, so you can just shove data through these models using an unsupervised learning algorithm and it just learns it. Um, yeah, some other algorithmic innovations uh, in training these deep neural networks. So some things called like batch normalization and dropout, residual connections, et cetera. Um, these are things that you kind of put inside your network. Um, it has historically been difficult to train neural networks as they get bigger and bigger and deeper and deeper. Um, you start having problems with the numbers inside the network, either just collapsing to zero or exploding to really big numbers, um, and it kind of just messes up the training. And so there's these algorithmic innovations that have happened, which has made it possible for us to train really, really large networks, whereas before we couldn't get very far with it. 
Um, and then access to massive amounts of parallelized linear algebra computations. So GPUs, uh, which uh, we, we all started using for graphics and video games, uh, turns out they're really, really good at uh, doing deep learning for certain types of deep learning architectures. Um, and then there's the transformer architecture, which uh, if you, yeah, chat GPT, uh, the GPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. Um, I mentioned LLMs is like a specific type of model approach inside of NLP. Uh, transformers are like a specific architectural implementation. Um, and that was a pretty big, uh, that, that was a paper called All You Need Is Attention, which came out in 2017, um, which introduced the transformer architecture. And that's pretty much what all of our language models today are based on. Um, cool, so uh, yeah, this is the, what a transformer looks like. Um, it looks complicated, but you can actually write this in a couple hundred lines of Python code. Um, yeah, as I just said, there's a research paper in 2017 that came out that introduced this architecture. Um, the really cool thing about transformers versus some of the other architectures that came before it is it, it fits real good on a GPU. Um, other architectures, like recurrent neural networks and some of the other approaches, uh, they required a lot of like sequential computation. So you couldn't put a giant massive amount of compute on a GPU and shove it through. Um, but with transformers, uh, and, and it's, it's a cool and interesting architecture, but like really the reason that it works so great, in addition to the attention mechanism, which is like really important, um, is it fits real good on a GPU. You can just shove data through. Uh, yeah, what's up, Doug? Yeah, so uh, do you see where it says masked multi-head attention? Um, there's two like big boxes. There's the encoder box on the left and the decoder box on the right. So this is, there's different types of transformers. This is a, just a picture of what an encoder decoder network would look like. Um, GPT, chat GPT I believe is just a decoder network. But you can see in both of the kind of bigger boxes at the very bottom, um, there's an attention mechanism. So it says multi-headed attention. And really all that means is like, you've got like a big piece of text you're trying to shove through this model. You only wanna show it a little bit of it at a time because you're trying to get it to predict the next token. And that's really like all the training of these things is really doing, which is kind of crazy that that works. But that's that unsupervised learning uh, algorithm I was talking about earlier. So basically like, you know, imagine a giant, giant, giant piece of text, you know, and you're trying to get it to like learn the concept is in this text. Basically like all you're doing is take a piece of the text and like put it in and like mask part of the text and then just like have it predict the next token and then you just keep advancing it and moving it forward and then like have it predict the next token each time. Um, and uh, you do that and you end up with a thing that understands human language. It's kind of nutty. Um, so we talked about tokens. You know, we talked about the text, actually. Um, you'll hear people talk a lot about tokens when they talk about uh, transformer models and language models. Um, so I, I just wanted to like touch on that. Um, like when you're playing with chat GPT, there's a limit to how much text you can put in your prompt at any given amount of time. So like when you go in and you type your prompt for ChatGPT, I don't know if any of you have tried to copy and paste a lot of text into your ChatGPT window and then you know, it'll come back and it'll yell at you and say you've exceeded the maximum amount of space, that your maximum length of what you can put in your prompt. Um, that's because they're trained to, yeah, they can only support like a certain number of tokens. Um, I get a lot of questions about like what is a token? Um, there's a lot of different ways you can do tokens in a transformer you can just say like each letter is a token, you know, and that's like a really simple way to do it, um, but it has some issues. You could just say like every word is a token, you know, um, that's another way you could do it. The way that most language models today work is they use something called sub word tokenization, which is where they kind of like break up words. Like if you have a really common word, like the word the, that's just gonna be its own token. 
But if you have like a relatively uncommon but large word, like, I don't know, dictionary, it's gonna probably break that up into like two or three different tokens. Um, and so what it's doing during training is it's actually trying to predict the next token, which could be a whole word or could be, you know, another, I saw a couple hands, what's up? Yeah, I just care about the limitation on uh, tokens. Is that just during the exercise of the model or during the training is also a limit? Yeah, so it's both. And, and one of the challenges with uh, the, the number of tokens that you can put into it, it's oftentimes called the context window of the model, um, is that the, uh, uh, I'll caveat this by saying that there are some new things that don't necessarily follow this rule exactly, but generally speaking, the amount of memory used by the model at both, at, at inference and training time, it scales quadratically by the number of things you put in it, which is a really complicated way of saying that like, it's, you know, it, it's like squared, you know? So if, like, if you have like, you know, 10 tokens, um, and then you wanna make that 100 tokens, then now the memory goes from like, you know, 10 squared to like 100 squared. So the more tokens you put in, it's like exponential. So it's, it's very much like a memory issue more than, more than it is the algorithm not working. Yeah. Can you tell us then how this relates to large, and where does large come in when we have this uh, quadratic uh, expansion of cost? Yeah, I mean, you need a lot of money to run, because <laughs> GPUs are expensive, which is, you know, which is why, uh, you know, the really big models are being run by the likes of Microsoft and Google and those guys. Yeah, what's up, Doug? The, the tokenizer was a lexicon right, written by a human. So in this case, is it an independent neural net that's doing the tokenization, or just some uh, statistical analysis that's not quite a neural net? How, how are you? What's yeah, the like how does it? Yeah, how does it come up with the vocabulary? Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. I, you know, I, I don't totally know the answer to that. I'm sure there's an algorithm that it that is used. I, I seriously doubt that you have a human that's going through and doing it. Um, but yeah, at the, at the end of the day, like the tokens supported by your model, it's what's called a vocabulary. And so like what Doug is asking is like, how do you come up with the vocabulary? Um, and there's some algorithms that I'm sure it uses to go and parse that, uh, put that vocabulary together. I, I don't know exactly what those are. But at the end of the day, like your model has a vocabulary and those are the tokens that it can support. And that's static and it doesn't change. Like once you've trained your model, you have your vocabulary for that model, um, and it doesn't change, and, and you don't really need it to uh, if you've thrown enough data at it. But like, here's an example of how you could tokenize this sentence, like, gorillas love to eat bananas. I like bananas, too. Um, and here's how you might break this apart. Um, so, you know, it's, gorillas is a big word, it's relatively uncommon, so it's probably gonna break it up into a handful of different tokens. The word to and the word eat, those are relatively common, so they end up being their own tokens. Um, so, so anyway, it's a deep dive into what tokens are. So when you hear people talk about chat GPT and you're limited to the number of tokens, now you can tell all of your friends that you know what a token is, which is. Um, yeah, the model, yeah, yes. So when you input those tokens into the model, those get loaded up into the large language model, um, into the context window of the language model, and basically like your text gets put in, and then it's like, okay, what's the next token? And then it takes it, and then it puts it on the end, puts it back into the model, and it's like, what's the next token? Pop that one off, and yeah. It, it is, it is um, uh, taking your text and then putting it into memory. And I say memory, I mean it's, it's going into a really large neural network. Y yeah, I mean, you know, it's going, it's feeding into a really large neural network. Um, and then that neural network is just gonna, it's gonna pop out the next token. And so, yeah, basically what it does is you shove all that text in and it pops out the next token for you. 
and then you take that token and then you just like append it to that big piece of text that you had before and you shove that through and then it pops out the next token and then you just keep doing that over and over again and uh, it writes you a story or you know whatever you asked it to do. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, what, what was the first part of your question about? Uh, I'm just thinking that a lot of words have many different meanings, even though the little children yeah. have many different meanings. So ill was the ill. Yeah. Well, so it's holding the whole thing in memory at one time. Yeah. And so it's it's actually looking at all of the other tokens. And it has built up through its training an understanding of that when I see this token and it's surrounded by all these other tokens, this is what it means. And so the training actually creates these, it's a, it, you know, it's, it's basically like, you know, for every token in your vocabulary, there's a relationship to every other token in your vocabulary. It's why this stuff gets really big in memory. And so it's actually looking at the relationships between every token compared to every other token in your context. And so it, it understands the semantic meaning. So it actually understands the meaning of what's happening because it has, through its training, built up all of these token relationships. And so it knows that like ill, when it is surrounded by all these other things, is part of the word gorilla as opposed to, you know, another meaning. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, it, yeah, it takes up very, very large amounts of memory and it's GPU memory, which is like the most expensive kind. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, we're not going to let you finish your talk. That's the question. Yeah. I'll, uh, yeah. yeah. You will move it. I might just, <laughs> I might just start so, gaming slides. I'm still locked up in this, like, n-squared scaling of memory cost with the number of tokens. When you're talking about writing a long story and appending it and appending it and appending it, yeah. are you hitting a limit to how long a story you can write then? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and this is why you have limits on uh, how many tokens you one can. One more. Okay. Yeah, I'm just know? curious. I mean, you're, you're talking. I kind of understand that you've got maybe a, an entire document in there that contains all the tokens in that document that are used to predict what the next token would be. Yeah. But the attention mechanism chooses just a, it's like a look ahead buffer. You're just choosing what's like nearest neighbors to the next token. Can well, you the, yeah, the attention mechanism comes into play really during training um, because it's, that's where it's masking parts of the input. And that's, that's really what the attention mechanism is, is it's really like masking. So you're passing stuff in and you're masking parts of it because you want it to predict parts of it. Um, but at inference time, and in inference is basically like when you're asking a question after training, um, you don't really need to mask. So it's just shove it all in, don't mask any of it, get the next token out, add that to the list, shove it all in and keep going. Okay, I'll take one more and then, and then I, I wanna get through yeah, more slides. Yeah. 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 Can we just take the ASCII characters as yeah. Wouldn't the attention mechanism be able to figure that out? Why, why, yeah. why is that advantage? Yeah, like why, why use subword tokenization? Yeah, because there's a trade off between, um, like, the, so in that case, you have a very small vocabulary size. And so the number of relationships that you can create is more limited because you're really just creating relationships between letters and other letters. Um, and what you really want to do is to be able to create, you, you want a larger vocabulary than that so you can create a much richer representation of the relationships. So in the case of letters by letters, you've got 26 squared you know, relationships that you've created there. If you have a vocabulary which is 5,000 tokens, then the relationships that can be expressed in that are much larger. So, uh, cool, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep jamming here. Um, yeah, this is the first part of uh, I think like four or five parts. So I'll keep going and um, we'll do a few more questions here in just a little bit. Uh, so uh, I talked a little bit about parameters. You hear people talk about parameters, like how big these models are. Um, so LLMs are composed of many layers uh, of artificial neurons. So this is kind of, you know, like a very basic representation of what a neural network looks like. You know, it's, and they're basically just like numbers that are connected to other numbers. Um, and each of these numbers 
typically represented as like a 32-bit floating point number. Um, it's called a parameter. So you'll probably, you're gonna hear people talk about like model sizes in terms of parameters. Um, the Llama 2 models, which Meta just released like a few weeks ago, they've got several different flavors. One is a 70 billion parameter model. They've got a 13 billion parameter model and a 7 billion parameter version of the model. And all that means is that like, that's just the number, the number of numbers. This is like the number of weights and connections that they have in those models. And so larger networks are more expressive than smaller networks, and so generally they perform better. Um, but they also require uh, a lot more memory. Um, this is a logarithmic scale of just G LLM parameter sizes uh, over a handful of years here. And so you can see it's, uh, it's increased substantially recently. Um, somebody leaked a lot of information about GPT-4 uh, recently, and it is uh, rumored to have almost two trillion parameters, which is, uh, you know, really big. That's a lot. Uh, that's, it's like the biggest model out there right now, but it's also pretty incredible. Um, yeah, here's a few, uh, here's a few models, uh, just examples of models. Um, so Falcon, this is a 40 billion parameter model, it means that's 40 billion weights in it. There's also a seven billion version of it as well too. Those models were trained on a data set with one trillion tokens in it. So we've talked, you guys already know what tokens are. Um, Palm 2, uh, 340 billion parameters. Uh, GPT-3, 175 billion parameters. Um, and so you can see the, the size of the data sets uh, are now measured in the trillions of tokens. Um, parameter counts are for open source models, usually under 100 billion parameters, but a lot of the pro proprietary models now are in the hundreds of billion parameter models, and in the case of GPT-4, uh, over a trillion parameters. Um, some of the capabilities that these models have, you guys have played with ChatGPT, I'm sure, so you're probably familiar with some of this. Conversational agents, text summarization, um, can do semantic search, so you can do a search across um, your data and, and, and understand like what you mean uh, by, the, by the words, but yeah. Uh, sentiment analysis, so it can like look at text and it can understand, you know, is the person who wrote this email angry or sad or, you know, uh, what kind of sentiment they had in it. Language translation, um, so these models are very good at understanding the meaning of text and then translating it into other languages. They can generate code. GPT-4 is like a better coder than most coders that I've met. They're really good. Uh, yeah, content generation, so you can just like have it write blog posts or, you know, stories. Uh, yeah, they do a lot of really interesting things. Um, commonly used GPUs, so we've talked a lot about like memory and how tokens kind of fit into memory and a little bit about that. Here's, here's a few of the common GPUs that are out there right now. Um, there's, uh, they're all NVIDIA at the moment. There's other people that make, um, uh, I'll say hardware for training and running inference on large language models. Like AWS has their own um, ASICs, so they're like application specific integrated chips. So it's like their own proprietary hardware that they've built. Um, but I, I have this listed on here, it's not, it's not all that commonly used. Um, everybody's pretty much using some NVIDIA chip. The H100 just came out a couple of months ago, um, and it is a beast. Uh, but even that only has an 80, 80 gigs of memory. Um, and uh, so if you do a little bit of math, if you have a 70 billion parameter model, it's a, if all of those numbers are represented as 32-bit floating point numbers, that's four bytes per parameter, that's 280, you know, gigabytes of memory that you need. <laughs> and that's just to run it, that's not even to train it. If you're gonna train it, you need like two to three X that, num that amount of memory. So now divide the cost of an H100, which is about a $30,000 GPU, and uh, you know, gets real expensive really fast. Um, speaking of training language models, so I'll get through this section and then I'll, I'll, ask, I'll ask for questions again. Uh, but I wanna get through the training part of this. Um, there are uh, like three phases that you go through when you're training, you're trying to build like uh, one of these GPT models. 
Um, the first one is called pre-training. Uh, this is where you create what's oftentimes called a foundation model. You start with a you know, relatively randomly initialized set of numbers. Um, so the 70 billion parameter model, you got 70 billion relatively, relatively randomized numbers. Um, you need to get a data set, hundreds of billions up to trillions of different tokens, so you can pull off the internet in various ways. Um, you're gonna train that using that next token prediction algorithm that we talked about, right? So you're masking part of it, you're shoving part of it through at a time, and it's predicting the next token, and then at every step, if it gets the token wrong, you're telling it what it should have been, and it's learning and updating its weights. Um, and then the result that you get at the end of this massive, incredibly expensive training cycle is a, do it's a, it's a model that's just like really good at document completion. You can't even ask it a question. <laughs> it's, just, it's not gonna answer your question. It's, it's just gonna complete it like it was a document because that's all it's been trained to do so far. Um, so these, the output of this first really wildly expensive process is like you can't even have a conversation with it. Um, it's very good at like document completion. But the idea is that during this training process, it has built representations of complex concepts like different languages and what is a gorilla and various things. What is, how does that relate to bananas and all these different things? So it's like building representations of these things in, inside of its network. Um, but it's just really good at document completion at this point. So the next phase is typically like an instruction tuning phase. Um, so you'll start with your pre-trained model that you got in phase one, um, and uh, you need you're probably around 50,000 to 100,000 examples. I'm sure some of the bigger models probably have more examples than that. Um, and in this case, you're gonna use an actual supervised learning algorithm. And so in this, in this phase, you're, you're actually, um, you, basically what you want is like, hey, if I ask this question, this is the kind of response that I want. And so you need, you know, a few tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of, of examples of those. Um, this is where, I don't know if you guys have heard of like RLHF, it's reinforcement learning with human feedback. Um, that's how OpenAI trained their models. Uh, they, yeah, basically had humans giving feedback to the reinforcement learning algorithm. Um, and that is how they were able to essentially build up a data set that they could then use to turn their models into good conversationalists. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, the scale to take a foundation model and train and turn it into like an instruction to it, um, you know, it's still expensive, but we're talking like tens of thousands of dollars, whereas the previous phase is like millions of dollars, probably tens of millions of dollars. Um, and then at the end of it is a, is a model that is conversational and it's capable of following instructions. Um, a lot of times, uh, businesses will want to customize a model to do something very specific to them. Um, they may want to teach it some concepts that it, has, it was not learned before. Um, they may want to fine tune it on some industry specific information. They may want to customize the output of it so that it outputs in a specific format that they can use for, for their system. Um, and, uh, and so this is, uh, I've actually done this and, and you know, you can do it at home. Uh, if you so choose, uh, but uh, yeah, you can spin up like, you know, probably a, one of the smaller models. I did it with a um, uh, Flan UL2, which is like a 20 billion parameter model, but you can get a GPU server and you can spin up um, a GPU server with uh, a model and you can fine tune it and um, give it, you know, a few hundred examples of some customized input and, and output that you want it to learn and, uh, and it works pretty well. Um, yeah, and there's some techniques that you can use to save yourself a whole ton of money um, when you're training and fine-tuning a model as well, too, and I'll talk about some of those here in a minute. Um, but uh, what you get at the end of this phase is it's a model that is conversational um, and it's tuned to your specific requirements. So, you know, again, there's like kind of three phases. There's the big, massive, really expensive process of building a foundation model. There's instruction tuning it, so you can actually have a conversation with it and it can follow instructions for you. Um, and then there's kind of this other phase that some people will go through to customize the model even further for specific industries or specific use cases. Um, 
some, uh, here's some estimates uh, that I put together and pulled information off the internet, try and put these numbers together. Um, a lot of, yeah, the, uh, uh, the information around how much money these companies actually spend to train these is not necessarily like something that they share openly. But you can do a little bit of back of the envelope math to try and figure this out. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, to train Llama 1, the first version of Llama, they used over 2,000 A100 GPUs. Each A100 GPU is like 15 grand. Um, uh, and it took 23 days on over 2,000 GPUs in order to do that training. And so this, that was very expensive. Uh, uh, some of the estimates out there said it's probably around $30 million in order to do that. Um, you know, GPT-3 uh, is about four and a half million. GPT-3, relatively speaking, is like a, is a much smaller model. Um, Falcon 40B, which just came out a couple of months ago, they spent two months on uh, 384 A100 GPUs, and so they spent a couple million dollars on it, which is, that's really cool, because they open sourced the entire thing. Um, and, uh, yeah, that was a uh, company, the name of the company is, I'm blanking on right now, they're based in Israel, they put a lot of money into this, uh, and then they, they gave it away for free, which is uh, pretty awesome. Um, so we talked a little bit about like how you can save yourself some, some time and some money if you're fine tuning your own language model. Um, there's this thing called parameter efficient fine tuning. Um, one version of this is called LoRa, which is called low rank adaption. Um, this is pretty neat. So you can actually take your big giant model that you want to fine tune and customize, and you can actually freeze all the weights in this giant model, and then go in and insert a couple of layers in there, and then pass information through the network, and then backprop your error through the network during the training process, but only change those couple of layers that you put in there um, and a lot of times the number of layers, like the, the number of parameters that you use in those layers, it's about two to three percent the size of the whole network, and it works exceptionally well. So you just like freeze this giant model and you put a couple of little layers in there, and then you only modify those layers during training. Um, and, uh, and then at the end of it, you've got this like little adapter that you can snap onto that model, and it now is, uh, augments that model with the capabilities that you just trained it on. Um, and so this takes way less memory. Uh, it goes much, much faster uh, than if you were to try and fine tune the entire network. And so there's a lot of, there's some variations on this. There's a lot of people that are using LoRa to do training on their networks because it saves a whole bunch of time and money. Um, let's see, yeah, so like I said, reduces the number of trainable parameters by over 95%. Uh, the original weights are frozen. You end up with these little adapters. The other thing is cool is you can make a bunch of these little adapters and you can stick them wherever you want. And then if you want to like pull in some capability on your model, you just grab the adapter that you want off the shelf and snap it into your model. And now it's like you can change how the model operates just by snapping in these little adapters. Uh, this is pretty neat. Um, yeah, and the performance of the models that you get after fine tuning on LoRa is it's uh, it's it's not going to be the same as fine tuning the whole the whole network, but it's uh, it's pretty darn good. Um, yeah, uh, let's see. And then I talked a little bit about these networks being like 32-bit numbers. Um, you can actually represent these. Uh, there's this thing called quantization, which I'll talk a little bit more about. You can actually take those big 32-point or 32-bit floating-point numbers, actually just like represent them as 16-bit numbers, and you can train with 16-bit representation, and it's like pretty much as good as training at 32-bit. So I think one of the things that we've discovered relatively recently is like 32-bit's overkill, 16-bit works really, really well, and then if all you're doing is inference and you're not training, yeah, you can represent it a lot less. I'll talk, I'll talk more about that. Uh, this is like a good point. I'll just kind of pause right here, see if anybody has any questions. Yeah, there's a handful of questions. What's up? Who wrote Laura? Uh, oh, it was written by people. Yeah, so there's like papers, there's like research papers on it and how well it performs. Um, and there is a library called Transformers, uh, which was written by a company called Hugging Face. Uh, wonderful name. Uh, they actually, yeah, uh, silly name, but they have amazing stuff and they're actually the reason a lot of 
the stuff that we're doing today actually works. They have amazing tools. But they actually built an implementation of LoRa. Um, and it's all open source, and so you can download the Transformers library and use their, their uh, LoRa tools and train up a network with it. Yeah. Uh, what, what else? Uh, yeah, what's up? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so yeah, which is, which is kind of, um, I feel like that's related to the question of like, why would you fine tune your own network? Um, so like I'll, I'll give I'll give an example um, of uh, you know when you're integrating a language model into your application um, there so there's some things I've been working on lately where basically like we've got some application and we want to send stuff to a language model and we want to be able to get it back and we want to be able to get it back in a way that we can like easily parse it with like computer code so like. I don't know if you guys know what JSON is or XML or you know like these kind of like computer representations of things. Sometimes it's really nice to not get the answer back as a big giant blob of text, but to instead get it back as something that you can then parse and then your system can do with it. Um, and so, uh, like one of the um, fine tuning examples that I've seen is basically just to like take a well trained uh, language model and then fine tune it with input in text but output in JSON. And if you do that enough, then your model is really good at outputting in JSON format, which is great, because that makes it really easy to integrate into uh, like a regular application that somebody has written. Um, and so what you do is you build up a data set of like, here's some text in, here's the JSON that I want to get out, and then you fine tune it on that, and you can have a little LoRa adapter that you then can snap onto your model and uh, it'll do JSON for you. Uh, yeah. One quick question. We can have access to these slides at some point so we don't have to take pictures of them. Yeah, yeah, so we'll send that out. Um, the, same, the real question is, is the reusability of the adapters or at least the automation of their training so that if you were to change foundational models, uh, maybe mm -hmm. just an update of it or swap out, would you have to start all over again? Can you re yeah. encapsulate the training? Or? No, it's really tied, that, that, that LoRa adapter is really coupled to the model that you trained it with. So you couldn't then take that and snap it on to a totally different foundation model. You would, if you wanted to use a different foundation model, you would need to train up a new LoRa adapter for that. Um, yeah, uh, what's up, Doug? Okay, so help me connect the dots here. Yeah. You've got parameters, which are the same as weights, yeah. right? And basically those are memory elements in the GPU and the GPU has like 80 billion memory elements and there are multiple GPUs. Yeah. How many commute, compute elements are there? How many layers are there uh, in the net? And is that something that's dynamically determined or is that something that's coded? How does that work? Yeah, so you're asking like how many layers there are in your neural. How many layers and how many commute, how many compute elements in the GPU? That, so how many parallel operations can you do on that 80 gigabytes yeah. of data? Yeah, good questions. Uh, so the first question is how many layers is your neural network? That's entirely architecture dependent. Um, yeah, one, one foundation model is gonna have one set of layer choices, uh, another one's gonna have another set of layer choices. Those are, those are kind of like the variables that different uh, implementations so, of language models. So chat models. GPT, for example, do we know what that underlying architecture is? Yeah. I don't know that, okay. unfortunately. Yeah. And, and they made the decision to train this on internet data, which is a combination of multiple languages, including computer languages, English. Yeah. They, did they intentionally mix the whole set, or did they say, let's train this first on a set of textbooks, mm -hmm. uh, and then a set of the code base from GitHub, um, so they have independent uh, prediction models? I mean, that, so I don't know how OpenAI did what they, I don't know how they structured their training. I've looked at how some other companies are structuring their training, um, and, um, and I, I think this is an area that is like very much changing and people are very much researching right now. I won't, I don't think that there is like a good like go to, hey, train on English text, train on this, train on math, train on, like, like train it in this, in this way versus like mixing it all together. Um, I have seen some cases where they have done structured training where they first train on this data, these handfuls of data sets and then they train on these. Mm -hmm. um, 
but uh, yeah, I, I don't, yeah, I, I think that's, an, I mean, these, that's another variable, like when somebody's building a foundation model that they can use to try and make their model perform better, and I think it's very much an open, like, research item right okay. now. Last one. Yeah. So these LoRa adapter things, what the heck are they? Are they actually uh, separate independent GPUs, or are they just, you know, some code running on a host computer? Yeah. What are they? No, it's, you can just think about it as, like, you know, that picture we looked at earlier of all the different neural network layers. Like, you can just imagine, like, somebody just putting in some more layers, and then those layers are basically your adapter. Okay, so they're like dedicated elements on the GPU. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. So they just they fit onto the GPU just like all your other stuff does. So it's not separate GPU or anything. It's all just part of the same network. But those layers are kind of earmarked as being trainable versus the other ones which are frozen. And then you can pop those layers off as an adapter later on. Uh, cool. I will keep going. I'll pause for questions again after I get through inference. So I talked a little bit about training. Inference is basically like what you do when you go to your uh, chat, uh, was it like chat.openai.com and you ask it a question and it gives you an answer. Um, that's inference, it's just a fancy way of like saying that hey, it's when you just you use your model, you're not training it. You're basically asking a question and you're getting an answer. Um, it is uh, significantly less compute intensive than training. Um, however, uh, you know, when you're talking about like these large language models, you still need pretty good, pretty good sized hardware. Um, so uh, yeah, we talked a little bit about like memory consumption. So GPU memory required if you're using 32-bit floating point numbers. Uh, yeah, so a byte is eight bits, right? So a 32-bit number is four bits. Um, and uh, so here's a little bit of like very straightforward math. If you have a 65 billion parameter model, uh, that's how much memory you need in order to, to, to use the model. This is not training, this is just to like ask it questions and get answers. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, there's this thing called quantization, which I talked about, uh, I just briefly touched on a little bit earlier, which was like, hey, we found out that actually 32-bit numbers are kind of overkill for training. Um, it turns out that um, you can go even like lower resolution if you're just doing inference as well too. So. Uh, so basically quantization is this process of representing the parameters using fewer bits. So uh, yeah, some common representations are 16-bit, which is uh, what a lot of people are using for training, uh, but then there's also 8-bit and 4-bit. Uh, I've seen people uh, even try 3-bit and 2-bit, uh, which is, uh, that's kind of crazy. Um, but uh, yeah, so quantization is basically a trade-off. It sacrifices precision for speed and memory. So it goes faster and it costs you a lot less in GPUs if you're using, you know, if you're down to four bits, then that's like eight X. That's an eight X improvement on how much memory you need and how much money you're gonna spend to, to run this model. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so uh, pretty much all the models, I'm running a handful of language models right now and uh, I don't run any of them above eight bit right now. Uh, four bit is uh, still pretty darn good. And I've got a chart here. Um, this is dude, uh, Tim Detmers, uh, he's amazing. Um, if you're really interested in like the technical uh, side of all of this stuff, uh, he's awesome. Um, and he's built a lot of the tools that people use today. Uh, but uh, he's got this chart of bit precision right here. And what's really interesting is uh, there's actually like an improvement in accuracy, um, in decreasing the representation up to four bit, and then you go to three bit and it falls off. And it just goes to, gar you know, goes to garbage after three bit and, you know, so uh, less than three bit gets pretty. Yeah, so uh, zero shot is um, basically like if you're giving it a prompt without any examples. So um, uh, an alternative to zero shot is what they would call few shot, which would be like a prompt. So that would be like giving ChatGPT a prompt where you're like, hey, I want you to write me a story. Um, and here's a little example of the kind of story I'm looking for. Here's maybe another little example of something that I'm looking for write me a story that's kind of like those two examples. Um, few shot, or, or zero shot would just be like, write me a story. 
like no no examples. Um, yeah, so quantization is it's it's like a free lunch. It's <laughs> it's kind of cool. Um, yeah, so yeah, like I said, I, I, we don't run any of our models at full 32-bit precision. Yeah, 16-bit seems to work great for training. Um, if you re if if uh, perform model performance is really 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 important, 8-bit is a good way to go for inference. Um, but 4-bit actually still works pretty darn good. Um, GPU memory continues to, oh, so I'll just transition real quick to this phase, uh, I'll talk real quick about just like some of the challenges working with LLMs and then I'll go back to questions. Um, GPU memory continues to be like the single largest hardware hurdle um, for, uh, for any model that you wanna spin up. Uh, the compute is expensive um, and uh, large models that require multiple GPUs and nodes are, they're, uh, a little bit of a pain to configure. Um, if you have all your GPUs connected to one machine, it's not so bad, but then if you wanna spread your model across multiple machines, um, there are some good tools out there and they're evolving quickly to make that process a lot easier, but um, it's still a little bit of a pain. Um, the open source tooling ecosystem is developing uh, super fast, um, but uh, robust offerings that are suitable for business applications just really aren't there yet. Like, I'll give a really simple example. Um, I wanted to spin up a conversational model at our company, because uh, we have a lot of really sensitive client data that we work with, and we do not want that going to OpenAI. Our clients don't want that going to OpenAI. That'd be real bad. Um, and so we spun up uh, our own internal language model. I think we're using like a 33 billion parameter model right now, um, and it uh, works great. I think we're running it probably at 8-bit at the moment. Um, but like you would think that if all you want to do is just spin up, I want a user interface, and you know I want a web app with a user interface that just talks to a model that I'm hosting on a server somewhere. Um, yeah, like you would probably think that's not like too hard to do, but there's like all the glue stuff that just isn't really there, and, and the security stuff around it too. So like, like you want a little HTTP server with uh, an LLM in it, and uh, you want that to be secure. It's like, I basically like how to write it myself. You know, it's not, not that that was like too terribly difficult, but um, you know, it's like we had to spend some time on it. And it like build the user interface and like, and then we had to like build the authentication and authorization code to put it behind all of our, like our login security as well too. Um, Cause like there's just not like a tool that you can just install on a server right now. It says, run this, run this app. I want this to be secure. I want you to use my like internal business authentication services um, and just have all the stuff run securely. And it just like it's just not there, uh, which is kind of cool because then you get to build it yourself, which is kind of fun. Um, the licensing landscape is just like kind of a mess. I will say it is much, much better since Meta released Llama 2 uh, a few weeks ago because they, the first version of Llama, um, this is Llama's a large language model that Meta, i.e. Facebook, released, kind of released. Actually, they didn't really release it. Uh, they were giving it out to people on like a research basis and you had to apply for access. And then somebody takes it and then they just put it all on like 4chan and then it got distributed across the internet and everybody had it, and then everybody used it. And then it actually turned into like the most innovative LLM platform on the freaking internet, which was like really cool because it, it drove a ton of innovation. Um, but it wasn't cool at the same time because the most innovative platform that everybody was using uh, was basically stolen from Facebook, so you can't use it at your business. So you could spin it up and play with it at home and do research with it, but you couldn't use it for a business. Um, but the Llama 2 model that they just released a few weeks ago, uh, that was amazing. There were lots of improvements in the architecture and in the training on it. And, but like most importantly, it has like a free for use license that you can use it and integrate it into your own products. Um, I think it's like as long as you don't have more than one billion active users. So. You know, uh, ba basically, if you're not competing with Facebook, like, you know, you're good. Um, so, I mean, 
it's crazy because I, I wrote these slides like maybe a, uh, a month or, yeah, a little over a month ago, and even now, like, you know, so much has changed. It's super exciting how fast this space is moving. It's a lot to keep up with, but um, yeah, so if you're a business and you want to use a language model in your product, you have to look at the licensing for the model, but then if you're using a variation, like a fine-tuned version of that model, um, which you probably want to use, because a lot of times they're better, you have to then go and look at like, all right, what data do they use to fine tune the model? And are those data sets also licensed for commercial use? Because there's a lot of like, like, even though Llama 2 just came out a few weeks ago, there are now fine tuned versions of it that perform way better than the version that they released. Um, and, but if you want to use it, you need to figure out what data they fine tuned it on. Uh, otherwise, you could have some legal issues if you're integrating it into your product. Um, so the licensing landscape is tricky. Um, yeah, and data security is a major challenge for uh, both the third party, so like the open AIs of the world, um, as well as the self-hosted models. Um, data security is a big deal. Like I mentioned, um, most of the clients that, that we work with, they don't want their data going up to the third party hosted cloud uh, models. Um, is, yeah, you just, you just don't, you know, what if they get hacked? You know, open AI is still a startup. They're still in like move fast and break things mode. Um, so, you know, like if we used it and their data, they got hacked and their data got released, like that would look really bad for us. So that's just a no, that's a non-starter. Um, and, uh, and you don't know, or you need to pay attention to whether or not they're gonna integrate your data into training. Like, by default, when you're using the ChatGPT interface, by default, unless you go in and explicitly turn it off, everything that you put in that user interface, they will use to train future versions of their models. Um, so there's, I, I can show you, there's actually like a little thing you can go in and turn it off so that they don't do that, um, but by default, everything you put into the ChatGPT interface is gonna be used as, uh, as training data for their future models, and Anything that goes into the training data set for a model, people have shown that you can find a way to get it out. So like you just you can get real creative with your prompts and whatever, and pretty much anything that goes into your training data, you have to assume somebody's gonna figure out how to get that data out of it. So like that's yeah, I mean these are these are important challenges. Um, I talked a little bit about the context windows for these transformable models already. Um, this is probably in terms of just functionality for the models the context window is the biggest challenge that, that uh, I'm seeing right now. The models are generally like very capable, although you know there's variations in how capable these models are for sure. Um, but like GPT-4, the biggest version of GPT-4 uh, has a 32,000 token context window, which is pretty big. You can put a lot of stuff into that. However, um, it would be great to have more like if you could stick hundreds of thousands of tokens in, like you could put an entire software product inside the context window of GPT-4 and just say add a feature. And it would probably do it pretty well, you know? And that gets pretty crazy. Like you could start loading up massive amounts of memory into the context window of these models. Like, like if it could, you know, if you get to the point where you can like hold like borderline all of human knowledge in the context window of one of these models, um, I mean, what, like, I mean, I don't, I, I don't know, man. Like, <laughs> like, it's, that's crazy. I mean, that's crazy. Like, you need a lot more than 32,000 tokens in order to do something like that. But if you take and extrapolate what GPT-4 is able to do with those 32,000 tokens you can put in there right now, and if it can maintain those capabilities to much larger token sizes, then just, just the, what you can do with the models qualitatively changes. I mean, it opens up massive use cases that you don't have today because you're limited by these context sizes. And it's and everybody who's building tools using these language models has to work around the context size, and it's just, it's just one of the, yeah, it, there's a ton of research going into extending these context windows, um, and it's happen, I, I say it's happening slowly, relatively speaking, um, although there are fine-tuned versions of open source models now that have 32,000 token context windows, and two months, three months ago, that was unheard of. 
your biggest context window was 2,000 tokens. And so I feel like we're spoiled. Sorry, Kevin, can you uh, go back and define what context window is? Is that the, the prompt history? That is, yeah, that, that is how much, that's how many tokens you can put in the model at one time before you run out of uh, token space. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that, that is the, those are, that's the number of tokens that you can stick in the model at one time. So it's 32,000, and it's not, that's not, sorry, that's not 32,000 kilobytes, that is 32,000 tokens. Yeah, so it's 32,000 tokens that you can stick into the model at one time. And it, this is GPT-4, the, well, the version of GPT-4 that you use in the user interface is limited to 8,000 tokens, but there is a 32K version that you can get access to via their API that has just, yeah, it's a bigger context window. Um, but yeah, it's just basically like, you can think about it this way, how much can you put when you're in the chat GPT UI how many things can you copy and paste into that window at one time? How much information can you copy and paste in there at one time? It's limited to, uh, yeah, in the UI it's limited to 8,000 tokens, but they do have a 32K version. Um, and then uh, you may have heard of this thing called hallucination, um, which is basically like, um, yeah, some, uh, I like to say language models are kind of like CEOs. A lot of times they're confidently incorrect. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're poli yeah, we're poli that's another great example. We're politicians. Confidently incorrect. Um, they will uh, give you the wrong answer, but they will do it so confidently and so eloquently that you will be like, oh man, yeah, that's, gr that's a great answer. There is a really uh, terrible story of some lawyers who got into some trouble because they, uh, they cited some cases that they got from ChatGPT like they went into a court case and they were like referencing these past court cases and the judge was like, I've never heard of these. And he looked him up and he was like, I don't think these exist. And it turns out that they didn't exist, but these lawyers just asked ChatGPT about some case history and it just spit out some confidently incorrect answers and they copy and pasted it into whatever and took it to court and you know, that's on them, man. Like that's <laughs> like, yeah, but that's called that's called hallucination. That's that that confidently incorrectness. Um, they call hallucination. It it is like it's a, it's a res I mean, there's a lot of research going on to into how they can prevent hallucination. And I don't think anybody has a really good answer. But I I think it's it's a it's like I'll give you, this is purely my own opinion slash speculation on this, because I haven't, you know, I'm not on one of those research teams trying to figure this out, but it's like, if you think about what these models are doing, they're basically just trying to predict the next token, and it turns out that like, a lot of times, like, the best way to predict the next token is to understand the rest of the, like, what the question you're being asked, and to give the, a good answer. But like another like really statistically appropriate way to, to predict the next token is just to give something that sounds good, you know, without necessarily like understanding the question or having the information to answer the question. Because um, they're really just trying to predict the next token. And so a lot, it turns out, and it, it is, in my opinion, it is just shocking that it gives the right answer so often. Um, because it's really just, it's just, it's a probability engine, and it is trying to come up with what is the next, what is the next highest probability token, given what I, the information that I already have. So the, again, the fact it gives so many right answers is like kind of amazing. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I, so I'm not too surprised that based on the way these things are actually functioning that they're giving incorrect information, because they're just trying to come up with the next statistically probable token. Um, another big one here I want to touch on is like bias and fairness. Um, uh, these models are getting integrated into systems all over the place. Um, uh, and uh, the, the, the accuracy, there's like a helicopter going on. Yeah, cool. Should get like a landing pad here at Barn for helicopters. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, these models are only going to be 
um, as accurate, as biased, and, and, and uh, fair, or unbiased and fair as the data that you train it with. Because they're really probability statistical engines at the end of the day. And so they are essentially sampling across a data distribution that came from the data set it was trained on. Um, and if that data set is biased towards you know, groups of people and so forth. Like a, like a good example I heard recently as I was talking to somebody who ran a startup, it was like an education technology startup, and one of the features that they were using AI for was like, hey, recommend some classes for me. Um, you know, and uh, uh, it recommended science and math for men a lot more often uh, than it recommended it for women. And, and uh, so they, they didn't notice that, and they saw that, and they were like, wow, we really need to change the way that we're training our model. And turns out you dig into your model, and your data set is heavily biased towards math and science classes for men and you know, other stuff for women. And so they had to go back and redo their data set to retrain it so that it was not biased. Um, again, it's only going to be as good as the data that you train it with. Um, and then, uh, I think this is the last one, AI systems are very difficult to interpret. Doug and I were chatting about this before. Um, it's basically like, how do you explain why it's giving you the answer that it's giving you? I mean, these things are tens of hundred, hundreds of billions of numbers just all connected together, and you're just doing linear algebra across these hundreds of billions of numbers, and it gives you an answer. And it's like, okay, why did you come up, why did you give me that answer? I don't know, man, it's, <laughs> it's 100 billion numbers. Like, how do you answer that question? It's really hard, but like, it's really important, too, because there's a lot of use cases, like in, like in finance, right? If AI is being used to make investment decisions, and it's moving around like tens of millions of dollars of people's money, you know, if it makes a bad investment decision, somebody's gonna wanna know why did it do that? And like, so like, there's a lot of, and there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of businesses that are legally required to provide justification for the decisions that they're making. And so if you have AI that's, that's making those decisions for you, you literally can't use the AI if it can't give you the answer. Um, yeah, what's up? So the AI is just kind of like, there's no stochastic nature to it. Like, there are some models where, depending on what the random number is, it can give it to Yeah, yeah, so you can, you can give it like what's called a seed. Uh, yeah, which is basically like, like a, it's just, it's just a, a meaningless number. But if you give it the same seed and the same input, it's gonna give you the same output every single time. Um, yeah, so you, you can, you're, you're absolutely right. It's a great point. It's, it's like, are, like, are they deterministic? Which is basically like, if you give it the same input, will it give you the same output? And, and yeah, it, it will. Um, that doesn't necessarily make it easier to explain why it gave you the answer that you did. But, but it's a good point. They are deterministic. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah, you could uh, hire an intern to spend six months, yeah, pick through all those different, all those different weights and try and figure out uh, which one do I have to tweak to get the right answer. Um, cool, this is my last set here, and I realize I'm at time, uh, but uh, I'm gonna jam, Doug, can I jam through this last little yeah. six? You won't hurt my feelings. You could be paddle boarding right now. Um, yeah, uh, the future of LLMs is just like some of my thoughts on like where this is going, where I see some of the stuff going. Uh, the hardware game is heating up. Uh, NVIDIA is just absolutely dominant. Uh, great stock to buy. Um, yeah, uh, AMD is coming out with some uh, cool looking GPUs. I think they're gonna probably launch one later on this year, which I think uh, has like a little over 100 gigabytes of memory. Uh, but actually last week NVIDIA just announced the um, their H200, which is gonna have, I think, 140 gigs of memory. So like, I mean, NVIDIA is just like absolutely dominating the hardware space. Um, the landscape of tools to make training and hosting language models uh, is changing on an almost daily basis. Um, like the project I mentioned earlier where I set up like an internal language model and I had to build a lot of the like glue stuff. Um, if I were to redo that right now, there are tools that I could use to replace some of the stuff that I, I had to build. So, uh, I mean, this stuff is changing so incredibly fast. 
so many of the current setup and configuration challenges that you have today, they're gonna be solved in a few months. So this stuff's moving incredibly fast. Um, techniques like quantization, which I talked about before, um, and then also CPU optimization are making it possible to run smaller and more capable LLMs uh, on consumer hardware. So there's a lot of folks who are doing a lot of work to take uh, some of these models, and they're typically smaller models, like 7 billion to 13 billion parameter models, um, but running them on consumer hardware. So if you really wanted to, like there are versions of the Llama models you could run on your own laptop. Like it's gonna be a little slow, but, but you could do it, and there are people that are doing it. Um, so like this is idea of like edge AI. Uh, I, I think as we get better at making small models more capable and then optimizing them for like, qu like quantizing the weights and optimizing them for th like CPUs, um, like I think we're gonna, uh, yeah, I don't think we're too far away from like having a model which could actually like run on your iPhone. I, I'm pretty sure there's some folks that have managed to do that. Um, innovations and in training techniques, uh, I found that, yeah, I think I just said this, training smaller LLMs for longer, uh, oh, yeah, can actually generate comparable results to larger LLMs. Um, so I, a lot of times people just stop training their models because they've run out of like compute budget. Um, but there's a lot of good research that shows that if you were to continue training a lot of these models, uh, you could get a lot more capabilities out of them. Um, which, you know, again, I think is part of why we see some of the fine-tuned models that people uh, spin out of the foundation models have a lot more capabilities because they're, they're, you know, training them for longer. Um, yeah, there are many papers coming out from researchers attempting to improve the context window problem. Uh, a breakthrough here would just fundamentally change the scope of what LLMs can do. Um, this is a, it's a hard problem. Um, there's a lot of people working on it, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, like I, yeah, it, I can't undersell what a game changer it would be to be able to have massive context windows. Like, it'd be kind of scary what the models would be capable of at that point. Um, LLMs are configured to operate as autonomous agents. Uh, oh yeah, this is this is one that I I've actually been spending a lot of research time on myself. Just like this idea of having a language model that, um, uh, and we were chatting about this right before I started too, um, it's like imagine uh, if you just wrote a script that just said like, you know, say you wanna solve some problem, you want like chat GPT, chat, yeah, GPT-4 to just like, I don't know, go out and like write a research paper for you, but like go and like do research on the internet, and then like maybe like turn it into a PowerPoint presentation for you or something. Um, you know, when you think about the things it needs to be able to do, it's like you send the problem to GPT-4, and then it needs to be able to like go out and search the internet. So, you know, you need to be able to like give it tools, maybe give it access to your file system. Um, and uh, so there's these like AI agents that are using language models, um, and basically like what they're doing is it's like, uh, hey GPT-4, here's the problem I want you to solve. Here are the tools that you can use to solve it. Uh, what would you like to do? And then it'll say, oh, I want to use this tool with these parameters. And that tool could be, I want to search Google for this stuff. Uh, or it could be, uh, I want to write a Python script that runs on your computer that creates a PowerPoint presentation. Um, and you just keep doing that over and over. And it's like, okay, cool, I'll go do that thing you want me to do. I run it locally. Uh, and then it's like, okay, um, cool. Here's a problem I want to solve. Uh, you told me to go run this tool with this stuff and, and I searched Google and here's what I found. Now what do you want to do? And it's like, okay, cool, now you want to do this thing. And you go and do that. And you just keep doing that over and over and over and over again. And it is capable of shockingly complex behavior. I, I was giving somebody an example earlier of where I told it to turn off the bedroom, turn off the, the bedroom lamp uh, in my house. And I told it like, I've got Casa branded home automation lights. And so it, figured out that it needed to install a Python library to communicate with my lights. Um, so it did that. And then it wrote a Python script to scan my network and find the bedroom lamp. And then it found the IP address for it. And then it wrote another script to turn the light off. And then it wrote another script to check and make sure that the light was turned off. And then it came back to me and was like, cool, I did it. And I didn't tell it like anything other than turn off my lights and this is the brand of light. You know, and I've 
had it do some other pretty, I, I um, like one other example I'll give real quick. Uh, this is just working with a client in the, the healthcare space and there's this large data set and wanted to be able to do like ad hoc analysis on a data set and uh, I gave it this data set and I was like, hey, like I don't think this is gonna work, but like, like run this analysis on this data set for me. And it took a couple of minutes and it like looked at the data set and figured out what type of data set it was. It installed the libraries it needed to, to connect to that data set it looked at all the database tables to kind of figure out what all the different fields and table names were. Um, and it kind of like peeked at each of the data rows to kind of figure out what types of data it was. Uh, and then it wrote a Python script to do the analysis I wanted, outputted it to charts, like image, image charts, like line charts, and then came back and was like, cool, I did it. Um, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, it, was, it was like a very surreal kind of experience. Like, wow, <laughs> I'm like, oh my god. Like, this is crazy. Uh, so I, I, I think that we have just scratched the surface. Like, even just the models that we have today, I think we have just scratched the surface of what they're capable of doing. Um, and there's a, there are a lot of research papers happening right now. Uh, people are doing a lot of research into, like, how can you build these just agents? And it's literally just, like, how do you build, like, a really fancy prompt that you send it so that it like knows what you're doing and it has the memory of all the stuff that it did before and it has access to all these tools and some of these papers have actually given it the ability to create its own tools, which works really well, uh, turns out. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think that like, I'm really excited about the, the agents that are being built right now and a lot of them don't work that great um, but some of the things that I've seen them do so far are really, really shocking. Um, so I, even with today's models, they're incredibly capable. Uh, I, think, I think we need a hands-on class on, on agents whenever you yeah. get the chance. Yeah. yeah, I have a whole other slide deck I could do and Excellent. then we could build it. Yeah. All right. I'll stop there. That's all my slides. So I'm just curious. You said you trained your own LLM. Do, do you have 2,048 C, uh, GPUs no. in your office, or how did that work? No, I managed to do that with uh, two A100s. Yeah, so there's a lot of services that you can go and spin up a model or go spin up a server. Um, yeah, and you pay, you know, pay hourly. Some of those like uh, like Volter, Paperspace, you know, even on AWS and some of these other ones, you can go and get, you know, relatively reasonably priced. Uh, GPU servers, I think for like a single A100, for the 80 gigabyte version of the, the GPU model, you could probably pay like two or three bucks an hour for it. Um, uh, yeah, so I got one, I think it had two A100s on it and probably ran it for like a day or two. Uh, yeah, it probably cost me a couple hundred bucks to do the whole thing and I really just did it just to, just to do it. Um, but uh, yeah, it's. It is re very reasonable to go in and fine tune your own model these days. And, and just curious, when you trained your own model, did you just get that kind of level one uh, system of weights? You didn't do the, the human uh, feedback to get labeling on it? You didn't refine it? Or no, did you do those I, things? Yeah, so I, uh, no, I, I wasn't training. Uh, I, took, I was working with a pre-trained model. So the model I was working with was uh, it's called uh, Flon UL2. Um, uh, it was built by Google, I believe. It's, um, uh, I think the UL2 model, I think, came out back in like February or March. Uh, it was a 20 billion parameter model. At the time, it was a really, really well-performing model, although even now there's much, much, much higher performing models. I, these days I would just go for the Llama 2 models. Those are kind of the go-to, but, um, now, I'm, I'm trying to remember what data set I used. Um, yeah, I, I don't remember off the top of my head. I think I just pulled, like, there's a bunch of data sets you can grab online. Uh, Hugging Face, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, all the models are on Hugging Face. All the data sets are on Hugging Face. So you can go on there and just kind of shop around. Yeah, that'd be a fun class, too. Fine tune the model. So. 1950, Alan Turing um, came up with the idea of the Turing test, you know, for machine intelligence. Yeah. So, are we there yet? And if so, <laughs> what what should replace that as the actual intelligence test? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, 
And uh, I mean, the, the fun thing about the Turing test is it's so non-binary, right? There's no like, you know, it's a very qualitative test. Uh, so it is, you know, we can all, we can all decide for ourselves when we feel like it has passed our own Turing test. Um, but uh, I have also noticed that uh, we as humans are like big time goalpost movers. Like I think if uh, you went back and showed anybody even 12 months ago what GPT-4 was capable of, they'd be like, oh my god, this is like from way in the future. This is crazy, crazy stuff. Um, and now I talk to people and they're like, eh, it's okay. Like, man, you're crazy. Like, this is, it's, uh, yeah, it's like what these models are capable of is just, it's mind blowing. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't think it's past my Turing test. Uh, but uh, I, yeah, I, I don't think it's very far. Any more questions? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I can imagine a big backplane uh, for 24 or 32 of these age 100 sticks out, right? Yeah. But then you've got a whole bunch of those backplanes lined up. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about data paths that I'm sure must be fine. Oh, yeah. And, and then you've got some kind of uh, controlling computer on each one of those data planes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'll say that's that's uh, very much outside of like my realm of expertise. But I I would highly recommend like if if like you're really interested in the hardware side of things, um, there's some really really cool um, presentations recently that the CEO of Nvidia has done, and they like I mean you're you're totally like you're totally hitting on it. Like when you when you've got when you're trying to shuttle this much data between all of these machines, right? Like if they're on separate machines, right? Yeah, it's like how do you shuttle this massive amount of data uh, from one machine to the other? Um, you know, it's like you're pushing it through your GPUs over here, but it's somehow got to get over here to this machine, and then like how do you set it all up so that you don't have any of your GPUs sitting idle and you don't want to be waiting on network transmission? And I mean, those are, I like, again, this is all, this stuff is all very much outside of like my, my knowledge, um, but there's, yeah, I, I, but I, I love watching the NVIDIA presentations. Like there was one, I think last week where they did the H200 announcement and they're like, they're talking about the machines that they're building now, which are like, they started $10 million and they have hundreds of these GPUs all, all snapped together They've got like NVLink, which is I think they're the fancy word for how they're connecting all of the actual right controller machines, like the backplanes that you mentioned together. Um, and it basically like you can treat it like a single GPU. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, the hardware stuff is really freaking cool. Um, yeah, outside of like my knowledge, but there's a lot of interesting stuff there for sure. Yeah. I, it's all, it's all, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's all probably like very, very, very highly custom stuff. Um, but yeah, they've got these like $10 million, like, I mean, if you go watch one of these presentations by the NVIDIA CEO, he had, like, he's got the screen behind him and they present these machines in like real size. And it's like me standing against this wall right here. And they're just like these giant massive machines with hundreds of these like $30,000 GPUs just stacked in them and all wired and connected together. And you can just go up and plug your laptop in and you treat it like a single GPU. <laughs> it's like, I mean, it's, that's like probably like an oversimplification, but like, you know, they're, uh, it is wildly impressive what they're doing. The is 6,100 of 44 bits. So it's a, it's a large <laughs> There you go. Thank you, Doug. Yeah. Have people tried the concept of uh, 
a deliberate pedagogy like in, in training like a staged sequence of targets like what what they do in music for example right practice your scales first and then go to the next stage right sorry so could you could you say that again i didn't quite understand the question uh, in training training large models have people tried um, introducing a deliberate s sequence of goals as 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 a p pedagogy like in Would you say like a deliberate sequence of goals? Is it, it yeah. Yeah. What do, what do you mean by that? You start with like, like for example, in, in uh, identifying, classifying pictures, right? Mm -hmm. you, you first learn how to classify lines and circles, get, get the model to a certain stage, and then go for more complex. Uh, yeah. Like similar to what people do in music, right? Yeah. You, you do your scales and arpeggios and go, go stage by, yeah. Yeah, so th this sounds similar to, I think, a question that Doug asked earlier, which is like how you, st how you structure your training data, right? Like, like do you want to train on what you consider to be basic facts in the beginning, and then like maybe you try, yeah, maybe you start with algebra, and then you work up to calculus and right. more advanced, like, do you structure the training that way? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, this, the short answer is like, I, I, I don't really know exactly. But I do know there's a lot of research happening around how people structure their data, and, and I, I, think it's, I, I think it's an active area of research at this point that I don't think anybody has a straight answer. It says, like, you should train on this first, and then this, and this, and then this, and this is the best way to do it. I think it's, it is a very active uh, area of research. One, one thing I will say that I found really fascinating is um, around just, the, like, I think it's kind of connected to what you're asking is um, like how you structure your training data. Um, I would recommend, to, there's, there's this paper called ORCA, which came out recently from Microsoft Research. And one of the things that they found was that you could get much better if your data set had, like in your training data, if instead of saying like, um, yeah, here's this math problem, here's the answer, right? If instead the training data was like, here's your math problem, and then it was like, here's how you break it down, here's how you answer this part of it, and then here's how you answer this part of it, and here's how you answer this part of it, but like you actually like help it walk through the problem solution, much better training results. Um, which is, ex yeah, exactly, which is weird, <laughs> right? It's like, I mean, that, that, like, that's pretty crazy. A and um, they have also found, there's a, uh, another paper, there's several papers around something called chain of thoughts, um, and, which is basically like, if in your prompt, um, you say things like, uh, like think this through, uh, like here, here's, the, here's the question I want you to answer, um, let's think step by step and Here's an example of what thinking step by step would look like. So you could do like few shot, this is an example of few shot uh, inputs. Um, and then like have it output the answer in like step by step format. It actually gives much better answers just by asking it to think step by step. So um, that's how I like to think too. I think better when I think step by step. And so like, there's something like really fascinating about that and almost, dare I say, human about that, the fact that these models perform so much better when we ask them to think step by step and learn step by step the way that we do. Um, yeah, there's something like, I don't know, there's something very cool about that. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, just two quick questions. First one, uh, just like quantization, the, the you know, 8-bit does almost as well as 32-bit kind of thing. Is that same thing true with the number? With the number of layers in your model? Mm. It m is more always better? I mean, I, because I know in, I've, I've done a little data mining in my former professional life. And you can overfit models too, right? Yeah. And 
and get false precision. So I, I was just curious about that. And then the second question had to do with um, the, all the poor junior high school and high school teachers out there that are receiving um, term papers written by <laughs> chat GPT and what, what kind of options they have for, and if, if there are any. So it's not just the text itself. It's not. <laughs> cool. I didn't know about that. That seems like a good. That seems like a good way to do it. <laughs> I mean, there are tools out there that claim to have that ability, although um, I, I, I think that it is, uh, I think it, I, yeah, I, I don't think they're very reliable. Um, this thing has confidence when you really use it. Yeah, yeah, and, and there, and, you know, and there's like, well, so, yeah, I mean, I think there's like an open question of like, like, is the text that these things generate really so different than what a human will generate that we think that we can identify it reliably? Um, but there also is this idea of watermarking, which I, I believe uh, is probably going to happen. Cause I, I, yeah, I, I've heard some stuff in the news. I haven't really dug into it a whole lot, but supposedly I think the big companies are going to start watermarking. Um, it's definitely image output, but I, th I think there's probably ways they can wa do watermarking and text output as well too, where they can intentionally embed like statistical watermarks in the output so that you can very reliably say, this came from this model, mm -hmm. for sure. But, the, but you have to intentionally insert that watermarking. Sure. You know, a slightly higher price service, it's watermark free. Yeah, or, or, a, or an open source or model. Yeah, you just grab an open source model and just take the, yeah, just take the watermarking out. If it's open source, you can just, yeah, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, did I answer? Yeah, you had a question about layers, and that's, uh, yeah, like, is more layers always better? Um, yeah, I mean, it, and that's, yeah, I, I'll say there's a lot of research around that that's, like, outside of, my knowledge, uh, I will say more layers is more representation. Yeah, it, it, it can, uh, much, you can have much richer representation with more layers. Um, you have to have nonlinearities between your layers, otherwise, like, you, you know, there's, you're not really gaining very much from it. Um, uh, you know, but, uh, yeah, I mean, how many layers do you need? Uh, I don't know, that's, yeah. I, I think that a, a lot of people, when they're trying to figure out how they want to architect their model, I think there's a lot of trial and error that goes into it. I don't think there's like a, um, like a, a, a math equation that says like, I want to train on this many tokens, I'm training for these use cases, I need this many layers, this many parameters. Uh, I think there's, there's still a lot of like trial and error around it. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great one. It's like have they have they uh, tried um, asking models the same questions and seeing how they compare? There's this uh, again on Hugging Face. This is the Open LLM leaderboard. So these are the open source models, and uh, yeah, there's a bunch of benchmarks which are basically like a whole bunch of questions and 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 the correct answers. And so basically, like this, this leaderboard is, uh, it is a running leaderboard of open source models that anybody can train a model, they can submit it to this leaderboard, and then the system will, will run these benchmarks on the model, and then it just, it's like, cool, what's the, uh, and it'll rank it compared to all of the other open source models on the leaderboard, and there's probably hundreds of models on here. Um, you can see this Llama 2, uh, up here, 
This is one I've been playing around a little bit with recently. It's the 70 billion parameter version of Llama 2 with some fine tuning on an instruction data set. It's by a company called Upstage. Um, is performing extremely well. I think it's, I, th I, I think this is kind of, I think it's finally at like GPT 3.5 level. Um, Uh, yeah, I'm not really sure what, what questions are in each of these. I know MMLU is like a really popular one. Um, yeah, these are just four different very common benchmarks. Again, I, I, I don't know what all of the questions are or topics are in each one of these. Um, but I know they've got a, there are a ton of different benchmarks out there. Um, yeah, there's benchmarks around just question and answer. There's benchmarks around the ability to solve math problems. There's benchmarks. There's a really common one called human eval, which evaluates how good of a coder the model is. Um, unsurprisingly, GPT-4 is like the dominating model on everything. It's the number one on literally everything right now. Uh, but I mean, like every day open source is, is making progress and getting better and better. So uh, yeah. yeah, that's a good question. Any other questions? Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll keep, I'll, if you want to leave, I won't take offense. Um, just two, yeah, two more specific ones. Uh, you, you talk about the context window being kind of the bottleneck right now. Yeah, you also talked about how adapters, as is, is you're going to incrementally smaller and more specific adapters, those are pretty cheap. So instead of a big context window, could you just do a little bit more training? Say you wanted it to understand a whole code base or a whole novel or or something like that and use that for training instead of a context window so you could use a smaller context window? Yeah, so yeah, so that's a, this is a great question, um, which is basically like, hey, instead of using the context window, could I just train the model on my data so that it learns my data and I can just do that instead of the context window? Um, and the reason that doesn't work great, there, there's a blog post out there that I really like, which is that like, um, fine tuning is for form, not facts. Um, so fine tuning is actually like, it's not a good, it's not a very reliable way to get your model to learn facts, um, mainly because of the hallucination problem. Um, it will, it's really good, fine tuning is really good at customizing the output uh, or to get your model to learn concepts. Um, but it is not a good, like, like Sam Altman, uh, he a lot of times makes this differentiation and he's like, look, like if these large, if we want to treat these large language models like databases, they are the worst databases, they are the most expensive databases, they are the least reliable databases we've ever built, but if you want to treat it like a reasoning engine, it's the best reasoning engine we've ever built. Um, and uh, so there's, there's oftentimes like a misconception of like, can I just use fine tuning to get it to learn information? And that just, it does not work very well in practice. I, I mean, this, this is like, uh, this is, I, almost everybody, almost every client that I talk to, uh, where we're like, talk, let's talk about AI and how you want to use AI. And they're like, immediate, I want to fine tune this model to do this stuff. And I'm like, no, you don't. Hold on, let's, let's like talk about what's the problem you're trying to solve. Like, like, oh, I need it to learn all this data and I have all these different customers and each one has their own customized data set. And it's like, cool, it turns out you can actually fit most of what you need to into the context window 95% of the time, solve your problem that way. Um, and uh, yeah, fine tuning, just, it, it it's, uh, just doesn't learn, it doesn't hang on to facts very well. Um, I think it is surprising to me that GPT-4 is as good at facts as it is. Um, but a lot of times what people do is they'll use something called retrieval augmented generation, uh, which is basically have a database in front of your language model and then you ask a question and then you search the database for information about the question and then you, and those are facts, and then you stuff those facts into the context window and send all of that over to your language model. And so your, your prompt is actually a bunch of facts relevant to the question and your question, and that has been shown to very reliably reduce hallucination, and it is a great way to give it facts. It's, it's actually really good at facts that are in the prompt. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, great, great answer. Um, 
and, and I promise this may be my last one, so thank you so much for the time you've taken here. I really, yeah. really appreciate it. Um, so I, I, look at, I look at you going, well, you can go from 32-bit accuracy to 48-bit accuracy, and you get virtually the same or sometimes even improved results. So my reaction is more nodes. You know, you got, you've already bought your set of A100 <laughs> chips. Why, why aren't you getting denser, larger networks instead of uh, higher, higher resolution parameter? Or is that kind of run into a computational cost? Or? Yeah, I mean, the, the problem is, is that still, even if you're scaling down to four bits, you know, even, even, even when you're scaling down with quantization, um, I, I mean, it, it, I'll just say, this really depends on how big your budget is, uh, right? You know, um, for a lot of companies that want to run these models, um, you know, the, uh, yeah, I mean, it just, it just really depends on what your budget is, but, um, uh, yeah, it's like, do you want to use a 33 billion parameter model? Do you want to use a 70 billion parameter model? Do you want to use a couple hundred billion parameter model? Um, I mean, those are all trade-offs, right? Like, at the end of the day, if you can get, uh, you know, if you have X number of compute budget and you can run, um, you know, a bigger model at four bit inside that, you're probably much better off with a bigger model at lower precision than you are with a smaller model at higher precision. Yeah. I'll say that is, uh, that is above my pay grade. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'll say, um, yeah, I mean, I'll throw, what was that? Pl a, prompt, a prompt engineer? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, like, I, I don't know what's gonna happen, uh, and I, I, I feel like it's a great question and a great opportunity to insert my own opinion into this stuff, uh, which who doesn't love that opportunity? I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think we're gonna see automation on a scale that we've never imagined. I think uh, a lot of things that we thought would be like sci-fi in the future sorts of things are uh, gonna be, uh, are gonna, I think, I think we're, th we're gonna be very shocked by how quickly things are going to change. I mean, there's even like, like if you're into the robotics applications of this stuff, like check out RT2. Uh, I mean, they've got uh, vision, you know, it's something Google is working on. These are basically transformer models that have vision capabilities built into them as well. Um, and uh, they told this thing to pick up the extinct animal. And, uh, you know, it, uh, it understands that these things sitting on the table represent animals and that some of these are extinct animals and this is the extinct one and it knows how to pick the stuff up, you know, the dexterity to do that. So, I mean, it's... It is really wild, uh, you know, and this is, this is like, geez, this is like a couple of weeks old. This stuff, it is changing so incredibly fast. So I, I do think we're gonna see automation on a scale we've never seen before. We need to stop thinking that we need jobs. <laughs> like, like, yeah, I'll use this as my soapbox opportunity that says that capitalism is gonna like really, really, really suck for everybody at some point, yeah. Yeah, oh, well, yeah, but you know, we do recreation for the sake of recreation, at least I do, right? It's like right now, you, we've already got you know, robots that can outperform any human at any physical task, um, but we still do them and we still like to watch other people do them. Um, but uh, yeah, I think if we don't figure out a way to share the benefits of this technology with everybody, which let's face it, our current system does not, uh, there's gonna be 10 people who own freaking everything and everybody else is gonna get screwed super, super hard. Um, I really, really hope that uh, the people who keep voting against policies that allow us to share stop voting that way or they're gonna make it suck really hard for everybody once we automate more and more and more and more. Um, yeah, I think if you're looking for a job to get into, probably something in the machine learning field is probably good. Um, AI field is probably a good place to be, but yeah, or just by uh, if you are if you are so fortunate as to have money to put into the stock market, which let's face it, most of the country does not, so they will not benefit from any of this. Uh, let's, I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. 
Um, and I know I'm going on a little bit of a tangent, but you gave me the chance, the chance to do it. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, I don't know, that's my two cents on it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody.